This is the Life at Work Conference podcast, a production of City Bible Forum. Real workers, wrestling with real workplace issues. With your host, Life at Work National Manager, Andrew Laird. Welcome to episode three of the Life at Work Conference podcast. Today, we're joined by author, academic and speaker, Cara Martin, to talk about work as worship. I'm Andrew Laird, and this is the Life at Work Conference podcast. Well, welcome again to the podcast, Real Workers Wrestling with Real Workplace Issues. And for today's episode, I'm thrilled to be joined by Cara Martin. Cara speaks, writes and teaches, but is perhaps best known for her book series, Workship. So welcome to the podcast, Cara. Greetings, Andrew. It's so lovely to chat with you. <laughs> Likewise, Cara. Great to speak about uh, an important topic that we're going to be dealing with in just a moment. But before we head into that, Cara... I want to just play a short excerpt from a Life at Work presentation that you gave back in 2015. Now, the the sound quality is a little bit scratchy, but I think it'll be worth it. This is Cara speaking back in 2015. In Genesis 2.15, the first thing God actually told human beings to do was work. You can read that. The first thing that God actually tells people to do is to work the earth and keep the garden to the earth, keep the garden. And those Hebrew verbs, this is the dangerous thing about working in the Bible college, you end up going to Hebrew class. <laughs> those Hebrew verbs for work, ahad, and for keep, shama, are actually used later in Numbers and Deuteronomy for worshipping or serving God and keeping the commandments. So actually, we're, that's part of our worship, is the work that we do. And I've actually come up with a new word, it's going to be the title of my first book, Look out for it. <laughs> workship. Workship. Just think about that. You're not going to work today, you're going to workship. <laughs> okay, may not catch on. But <laughs> I hope it encourages you to think about your work as worship. Maybe that reframes what you see as your work. It's actually a way that you're worshiping God. Well, a little blast from the past there, and I don't know if you caught it, but Cara's comment that maybe the word workship might not catch on. Well, a little over two years later, you did publish that book, Cara, and the word has absolutely caught on with your original book shortlisted for the Australian Christian Book of the Year Award. Workship 2 is now in print, and I think Workship 3 is on the way. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> now tell me then, why do you think the concept of workship has resonated so much with people? Um, I think it's a really catchy word. I think it makes yeah. people sort of stop and, and think and then they're sort of curious about it. Um, so I think what's happened is that the average Christian has been sitting in the pew like I used to sing, sit in the pew and think my daily work doesn't seem to matter much to God or the church. Um And yet, uh, as one person told me, even while you're doing that, um, there's a niggling in the back of your mind that maybe God is interested in what I do. And uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to tap into, that God is interested in what you do, that what you do um, can be put into operation for the sake of the kingdom, um, and that you can worship at work. And I I think that that once people get it, it really catches their imagination. So I do know there's a bunch of teachers on the outskirts of Melbourne and they sign off on their emails um, something about yours in workship, (laughs) which I think is cute because it's just that sort of regular reminder that what we do can be done as an act of worship to God. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, now, just unpack it a little bit for more for us, particularly for those who are perhaps new to the concept. Obviously, the word workship, putting together the word of worship and uh, and uh, and work. Uh, so, how how is it that our work can be worship? Well, if we start at the beginning, we see in Genesis one that that God worked. And we're made in the image of the God who works. So that means that our work has intrinsic value. And the very first command that God gives us is to work, to steward his creation and fill in his creation. So 
we got right from the beginning this idea that our work matters to God, is important to God, and it's something intrinsic to how we're made. And then in the next chapter of Genesis, we see God and humanity working together. And then, of course, it all goes a bit pear-shaped in the third chapter of Genesis. Uh, And some people feel like work is cursed. Uh, But actually, if you look closely, it's the process of working that is cursed. So work is still a good thing, even though it's impacted by what has happened in the fall by sin. Um, And then as we go through the rest of the Bible, we see in Isaiah that our worship is, is not valued by God if it's not actually uh, lived out in our work. So there's a couple of points where God actually rejects the worship of the people, whether it's their fasting or their offerings, um, because he says you're oppressing your workers or you're cheating people in the marketplace. So work and worship are linked through the Bible, and we see it again in Romans when Paul says what we do with our body matters. Romans chapter 12, 1 to 2, he says that this is your true act of worship when you offer your body as a living sacrifice. So our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what we do with our bodies matters, including our work. And we can do it, in a, uh, do everything we do in a way that actually honors God. As we see in Colossians chapter 3, he, Paul reminds us that whatever we do, um, whatever we say, we need to do it in a way that honors the name of Jesus. Um, and then a little bit later in that chapter, chapter 3, verse 23, he actually says we should do our work as if we're working for God. And then right mm. at the end of the Bible in Revelation, we have this amazing picture in Revelation 21 of, of the kings of the world bringing uh, their treasures to lay at the feet of God and What are treasures? The treasures are a result of the ordinary work of human hands. And so in this way, all through the Bible, we just see this beautiful connection between work and worship. Um, It's something that unfortunately, I think, has been separated out in the way that we understand it today. Now, Cara, it's exciting and empowering, I'd say, for workers to consider their daily workers' worship. And you've touched on this a little bit. What do you think are perhaps some of the barriers to us taking this approach to our work and and how do we overcome them? Um, I think, you know, there's a saying of you can't be what you can't see. Uh, And so I think there's a a bit of a a barrier in terms of when we go to church, Um, if we see that the people who are up front uh, and honoured up front and prayed for up front tend to be people who are what I what I call the gold class Christians, they, <laughs> the professional Christians, uh, so the ministers and the missionaries, uh, then that seems to sort of create this barrier between uh, us thinking about our work as important um, at all. But I think there's barriers in society. I think, unfortunately, some of these attitudes within the church have reinforced the idea generally in society that matters of faith are private and uh, should be kept to yourself. They shouldn't uh, intrude on our work or other public spaces. Um, But I think there's also um, perhaps an unholy convenience in living dualistic lives. And what I mean by that is that Maybe it's convenient for a Sunday Cara to look very different to a Monday Cara. Um, Maybe it allows me to operate in my work in a way that if I thought about Sunday Cara, I might act a little differently. And I think there's a bit of a temptation to do that. Um, Maybe it's a bit of laziness or maybe it's just easier to do your work if you don't think about um, your faith actually entering into that space as much. But mostly I think... The problem is that most people just don't know how to connect the two areas of uh, their lives. Uh, They just they they don't naturally think of the connection points. Um, They don't see their work as a means of worship and they've never actually been equipped or challenged to think that way. Yeah, so there's obviously a number of barriers that you outlined there, including personal ones. I just I wonder if you can maybe unpack a little bit more, Cara. How do you overcome that that final barrier that you mentioned there in terms of if you do uh, separate yourself into, you know, the Sunday Cara and the Monday Cara, how do you begin to overcome that sort of barrier? Mm, 
Uh, good question. I think uh, one of the things is having a different sort of image in our head about how our lives operate. Um, Mark Green from London Institute for Contemporary Christianity often talks about us as either mandarins or peaches. <laughs> and I think the Sunday Cara, Monday Cara type idea is a mandarin idea. You know, you peel open a mandarin and there's all these pieces and each segment is a different part of our lives. So there'll be the Sunday car in there and the Monday car, the work car, and then there'll be the home car and there'll be all sorts of different caras in that in the Mandarin. But if we think of ourselves as a peach, we see that our faith is actually at the core of everything we do. Um, so rather than compartmentalizing different parts of our lives, um, our faith is, is uh, being in Christ is the center of everything we do. So Bringing that thinking in, we realise that it's important for us to be consistent from Sunday to Monday. Uh, it's important for us to overcome that mental barrier of compartmentalising, um, even if we feel that that's reinforced by either our church experience or by um, our experience in society. Um, that's not the way that God sees us. God sees us and sees our heart um, in every situation, in every context in which we are. Another thing I think that we often think, um, and I was guilty of this when I started work, it was almost like um, God was in my backpack as I went to work. <laughs> and every now and then I just let him out, you know, like I would mention I was at church on Sunday or I'd, I'd talk about praying or something and just let God a little bit out of the backpack, then shove him back down. But the reality is we don't have the burden of taking God to work at all. We know God is everywhere. He's actually in the workplace. He's already at work amongst our work colleagues. So then it becomes a matter of I don't have the burden of taking God to work. God is already at work. I need to see where he is and connect with him and what he's doing. So once we realize that God is at our workplace, um, that helps also to stop that sort of that idea that who I am at work doesn't matter so much because actually God is there and uh, he's ready to partner with me in that workplace. Mm, that's really helpful. Like, uh, two two radically different ways of thinking about things, you know, rather than taking God to work, he's already there and I need to imagine myself as a peach. That's the other thing I got from that as well too. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I think you make a cute peach. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Th thanks, Cara. <laughs> Now you did you did mention a moment ago as well that um the the how of of uh, bringing worship to our workplace is going to be a key thing for us to helping us overcome uh, some of those barriers. So uh, we're going to consider that in just a moment's time. But uh, obviously, Cara has already given us lots to ponder there already, and we'll keep doing some more of that, uh, in particular reflecting on some practical ways that our work might be an act of worship, the how. Uh, but I also want to consider with Cara the impact of COVID-19 on our work and how that might play into this whole conversation. So... Stay where you are. Be right back with our special guest, Cara Martin, very soon. Loving this podcast? Then don't miss the next Life at Work conference, Saturday, February 19, 2022. Wherever you are around Australia or the world, join us as we consider Flourishing in the Furnace, how God uses the daily grind to shape and refine us. Watch alone or host or join a watch party. Tickets now on sale at citybibleforum.org slash lifeatworkconference. Welcome back to my conversation with author, academic and speaker Cara Martin. Um, Cara, I want to think now about workship in the wake of COVID. Um, but before we come to that, I'd love to hear just some of your reflections on what you've observed about how work has changed in light of COVID. Uh, there's so much talk about this has had a massive impact on the, the way we work in the working world. Uh, what have been some of the significant changes that you've observed? Well, one of the things I really love about what it's done is actually break down some of that compartmentalisation. So we used to think of work as separate to home, but now we're working from home <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> yes. And uh, and so it's broken down some of that disconnection, um, that, that idea that we can compartmentalise our lives. And at the same time, um, in lockdown, we're going to church from home as well. And I'm just hoping that there'll be a breakdown between <laughs> work and church as a result of that as well. If we, if we can actually see that these things are artificial barriers in some ways, they're not, they don't have to be real barriers. 
Uh, the other thing I think we've really come to value in um, lock in amongst COVID is the importance of incarnation and presence. Uh, mm. When we've been separated from other people, it's it's renewed our yearning and our longing to be together, um, to be in the same room, to be able to speak face to face, and I. I think that's a really important idea that we are not just disembodied souls or disembodied workers. We're actually embodied and there's something significant in that um, that we should value. Mm. I think um, it has sped up technology development and there is a, a big risk that we'll have a further dehumanisation of our work. And I think that's a big danger that people see looking at the future of work that that will see human beings as resources rather than as people made in the image of God. Mm. But on the other hand, we have also have an increased appreciation of some ordinary work. I really love the way that uh, that we value truck drivers and people who stock shelves in the supermarket. In fact, I remember there was one time uh, when a few of us were waiting around and the shelf stackers started bringing out toilet paper and putting it on the shelves. <laughs> this was early in the pandemic and, and people just applauded. <laughs> it was just this beautiful moment of these people having their very ordinary work that normally you ignore or step around actually being appreciated. But we appreciate also cleaners and food delivery people and all these these jobs that previously we might have devalued or ignored, we suddenly value much more highly. So I think those things are good things as well, because I think every work, uh, everybody's work should be valued. Mm. That's a lovely story there that you tell about the the supermarket workers coming out with the toilet paper and getting getting applauded. And you're right that the the what we've deemed as essential work has been fascinating through this all as well too, isn't it? Though mm, particularly yeah. the kind of workers that, you know, previously we might have overlooked or not given a second thought to. And yet, as you've said there, cleaners, for example, how important mm. that we have realised the work they do is through this Absolutely. whole situation. I want to think about COVID and um, and and workship a little bit more in, in a moment. But just, just before we get to that, um, we've said already we really want to unpack the the how of workship, um, recognizing that as we understand how we might worship in our daily work, that's going to be one of the the big uh, ways of overcoming that 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 disconnect between these two things. So, can you just share some practical examples of what does it look like? How do we worship in our daily work? Sure. Well, I think the danger is, um, especially with that Sunday, Monday, uh, sorry, Sunday, Cara, Monday, Cara idea, is that if we're not worshipping God in our workplace, the danger is we will, we will worship the work itself and we need to break that connection. Um, our, our calling is to worship God and God alone. But work can so easily become an idol. So what we need to do practically, I think, is start each day acknowledging that God is present in our workplace, um, that um, that we are looking forward to actually going to work with God that day. So starting the day with just this reorientation um, that I don't leave God behind, um, God is there, I'm going to work to to join with God in the work that I do. And we might need reminders of that during the day because it's so easy just to get caught up with the busyness of what's happening. Um, I was talking to a guy the other day who told me that he sets an alarm on his phone for 10.30 and 2.30 each day because those are the busiest moments during his work day. And when the alarm goes off, it just flashes up, pray, pray, pray. <laughs> and uh, it's both a great reminder to him that this is the moment where he sort of reorients himself, reconnects with God um, in prayer. But it's also a bit of a talking point with other people as well. <laughs> um, but we also, I think another idea is, is to reframe our work, uh, to actually think about our work from God's perspective. How does it connect with God's work? Um, someone who's been really helpful for me in thinking this through is Robert Banks, who's an Australian who has written a lot about faith and work, probably um, more famous in America than Australia, but I love his work. Um, and he talks about 
the work that God does and how our work intersects with it. Uh, so, for example, um, God has promised to keep on providing for the world. So we need to think, how is my work part of keeping the world functioning? Um, and that's why administration is so important, because it's part of that low level keeping the world functioning stuff. But cleaning, we've mentioned, that's a really important part of that as well. And then God has, God has promised to keep revealing himself. So how is my work part of a process of revealing? We know that early scientists saw that what they were doing was revealing God's hand and God's mind to the world uh, through their work of, of science. Um, teachers and educators are also part of this revelation work. Mm. And then God has promised to care for people in the world. And there's always an aspect of our work that has some sort of compassionate angle. And then God is creative. We know he's He's the creator and we're made in his image. So how are, our, how, are there creative elements to our work where we can connect with him? Um, and that can be as mundane as creating a visually pleasing PowerPoint or it may be an elegant solution to a problem. There are lots of ways we can be creative. Mm -hmm. And God is also about justice. So what aspects of our work can be linked to justice? Um, that may be obvious if you're involved in policing or uh, in law or some in some way, but it could also be advocating for a work colleague who's been treated unfairly. And finally, God loves to redeem, and we know that he does this through Jesus. But I think we can also model redemption in our work, and it may be by holding back something that is bad, that's going to hurt people. Maybe it's promoting something that's really good that will allow people to flourish. Or maybe it's some other um, aspect of hospitality or beauty that's going to give people a bit of a taste of the kingdom. So when we do that reframing process, I think we begin to see how our work aligns with God's work. So just as an example of that, um, I got to go into the offices of Lend Lease and there was a woman there who was doing this fascinating project of, of putting plants on the inside of buildings to create a different sort of environment for workers, but also um, to refresh and oxygenate um, air in buildings. And as she was talking to me about this, she was a Christian, but uh, she sort of wasn't that, uh, yeah, she was just explaining what she was doing. And I was looking at it and I'm just saying, oh, my goodness, this is beautiful. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see these gorgeous plants on the inside of the building. And I said, it really changes the atmosphere of the building. Like it's, it's something that's, that's beautiful to look at, but it's also a connection with nature. Um, and it's, it's a connection with God revealing himself in nature as well. And, and she just started to shine because mm. she could see that her project was something, yeah, had a glimpse of something bigger than, than just work, which <laughs> we might see as a negative. She could see, a, beginning to imagine um, how God might see her work. And we began to talk about it more. You know, the fact that it's creating an environment which is healthier for people to work in is something that would please God. And and as we talked about it more, I could just see her getting more and more excited Um which she'd sort of attempted to dole down a bit, I think, previously because uh, she hadn't been able to see those connections. Um, but when she saw those connections, it gave her a great joy in her work um, and an ability to see how it might be pleasing to God as well. Mm. It sounds to me as though it would be a very fruitful exercise to take some of those categories or all of those categories that you mentioned just there and, and think them through in terms of our own our own work, you know, where where is there opportunities to bring justice or how does my work reveal or how does my work redeem or how does my work care, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and no doubt very empowering as we begin to see those opportunities. Um, that our work allows us to be and to do those things, and so and so worship through our work. Now that's that's really helpful. Thank you for that, Cara. Just coming coming to this issue of COVID though, and the the changing workplace, and I'm wanting to think about well, what does workship look like uh, in light of that? And you mentioned some of the potential for dehumanising that could go on. Um, there's a lot less physical interaction that is going on now with with colleagues, so. How do we workship or how might we begin to think about workshipping in this new sort of work environment? Yeah, I think 
I think uh, something that's really important, like when we think about worship and obeying God, we think about those two commands, you know, how do we honour God? Um, and some of those other aspects that I just talked about would be ways that we can continue to do that through our work. But the other idea is serving others. And to serve people properly, we need to be in relationship with them. And that could be the element that's that's sort of more difficult to do. How do we build relationship when um, a lot of the time we're separated or there's not those natural moments when we can build relationship? But I think, I think although it's tougher, it it actually can still be done. We're having so many meetings now that are on Zoom, etc. But that gives us a really interesting insight into people's lives. <laughs> We're actually getting to know people's home environments a bit more. Um, and sometimes it's just about paying attention to to what's in the background or if there's a pet <laughs> there mm. or just find connection points with people, um, which is a bit different. Um, but I think also it's... It's about noticing things. I have a work colleague who who says little things um, uh, about my appearance or what I'm wearing, and they're just tiny things. And I know that sometimes we have to be careful about saying some of those things, but I know she really notices me, um, and that's actually really nice. I know it's it seems to be an indication that she cares, that it's not mm. she just doesn't dive into whatever we're supposed to be doing. She's sort of taking the time to notice other things. Um, I think I think building relationship ta- will take a bit more effort and creativity. It might be sending texts of encouragement. It might be arranging a food voucher if someone seems to be overwhelmed by um, homeschooling at the moment. It might be, you know, a little delivery of flowers or a cake, just simple ways of demonstrating care. But really it's the idea is to sort of to build deeper relationships so that you can work out how you can serve people better at this time. And I think it's possible and I think people really respond to that as well because I think we're all a bit starved of of those sort of human connections. And Mm. so it's a great opportunity. Mm. No, there's some very helpful practical suggestions for how we might do some of those things. So uh, lots of very positive examples that you've given us. And you've, I think you've really opened up an exciting way for us to view our daily work in a way that perhaps some of us never have before. But any final words of encouragement to the person who hears all this and says, that's great, Cara, but you just don't understand how hard and challenging my job is. You know, just getting through each day is enough for me, let alone trying to work ship. Um, what encouragement would you give to them? Well, the last thing I want to do is just load someone who's already feeling burdened down with more burden. Mm. <laughs> but I think the first thing I would say is that God is actually in the mess and the tough stuff with you. Um, it's it's not like there's something that extra that you have to do. I think it, a lot of it's about being, um, actually being more aware that God is there, and being more conscious of His presence, and and looking for His uh, fingerprints in in the work around you. Um, and it's also a process of becoming as well. Um, so understand that that God uses. The workplace as a way of shaping you. So, for example, Eugene Peterson talks about the workplace as the primary location for spiritual formation, which is a mind-blowing idea. We we usually think of that happening in church or on a retreat or something, but but because our workplaces are places where it's so busy and we're tested and we're challenged and we have difficult work colleagues, um, we begin to appreciate that. Work is the place where God can form us, where he can shape us. Um, So I think that that's, once we understand that, we begin to see how God might be, it's not just about doing, we might be in a process where we need to be more conscious of being in God's presence or becoming more more like Jesus as a result of what we're experiencing at work. Mm. But the other thing I think we need to realise is that the way that God works is not so much... Um, putting more burden on us. It's actually by taking our burdens from us. I'm just thinking of Matthew 11, 28 to 30, those famous words where Jesus is offering to take our, take our burdens from us. And then he offers um, his yoke, which is easy. And if you think about a yoke, it means he's offering to work alongside us, to be beside us in our work. 
And then he goes on along in that passage, and I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase there, where he talks about Jesus wanting to teach us unforced rhythms of grace. And I think that's so beautiful and so so challenging to our work culture, which is all about ambition and striving, this idea of of just working alongside Jesus and and learning from his rhythms and working from rest really is what it's about, then it's something that's completely different. Mm, That's a lovely image to leave us with, that idea of being yoked with Jesus and having him at our side as we go about our daily work. Um, Cara, thank you so much for joining us on the Life at Work Conference podcast. Tell me, if people want to read and think more about Workship, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, the book is readily available from all your favourite bookstores uh, or online, but also I have a website, uh, workship.com.au, that you can visit. I'm on Facebook. Um, So lots of different places of connection. Um, I try and update people on different resources, um, different ways of thinking about their work and connecting with God amidst it all. Wonderful. Be sure to check out some of those uh, sites that Cara mentioned there. And if you haven't read her Workship series, uh, Google that. As she says, very easy to find a place where you can pick up a copy of, uh, of Workship 1 or 2. And we look forward to more in the series in due course. So Cara Martin, thank you again for joining us on the Life at Work Conference podcast today. It's always a pleasure to chat with you, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Cara. Well, look, that brings us to the end of this episode. Next time, we'll be exploring with an academic and a mother one of the more pressing issues of daily work, that is, I am what I do, the way we might tie our value and dignity and worth to what we achieve or accomplish. So you don't want to miss that conversation. But until next time, I'm Andrew Laird, and you've been listening to the Life at Work Conference podcast. The Life at Work Conference podcast is produced by City Bible Forum. To find out more and register for the conference, go to citybibleforum.org slash lifeatworkconference.